Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next two hours are devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have some truly great folks that join us every week, so Ravinder, tell us all about your chat room, please. Yes, we do have a great chat room, and there are people in there right now waiting to greet you as you come on in. Um, it's a great group of people. We share some really uh, interesting information and discussions there, so uh, we'd like to hear your contribution too. Uh, do come join us. That is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. All right, in this week's Spotlight, I want to address one of the most important questions of our time. And that is the question of free will. It's not generally a subject discussed broadly, so it may come as some surprise to many that most serious researchers question the very existence of free will. Just this past week, a new study shed some light on the subject. Researchers at the University of Berlin, following the work of Benjamin Libet, who showed that conscious decisions were initiated by unconscious brain processes, sought to determine whether or not one could consciously override this unconscious process. In the words of the researcher, Professor John Dylan Haynes, quote, The aim of our research was to find out whether the presence of early brain waves means that further decision-making is automatic and not under conscious control, or whether the person can still cancel the decision. Our study now shows that the freedom is much less limited than previously thought. However, there is a point of no return in the decision-making process after which cancellation is no longer possible. Close quote. Now, those of you who follow this show or my writings know that I've railed against the deterministic perspective often implied by studies such as Libet's or the fMRI work showing decisions can be known by an MRI technician watching your brain decide six seconds before you know your own decision. Now, it's not that there is anything wrong with these studies. It's more a matter of interpretation. Let me unpack that some. The cortical evoked potential Libet found allows only a few milliseconds to pass between the P300 wave, that is the activity in the unconscious, and the conscious action. Given this understanding, it would seem nearly impossible to alter the outcome of an unconscious process dictating a conscious action. However, using fMRI, we come to understand more clearly the process, and we learn that there is more time than the interval of milliseconds. Still, the likelihood of consciously making the change is not high unless it is made almost instantaneously. This simply means that the nature of free will we experience is seriously limited unless we consciously and carefully choose and sort out the information our mind will use to make its decisions. Please allow me to parse that out a little more yet. I fleshed this out fully in my book, Gotcha, The Subordination of Free Will, but for our purposes here, this short description will work. Think of your mind analogously to that biocomputer so much science fiction has been written about. Or for that matter, years ago, a great self-help book by Maxwell Maltz titled Psycho-Cybernetics, which addressed the mind as a computer that made computations based on its content. If you asked a computer to calculate the sum of 1 plus 1, it would first need a program to do so, and then the programmer would have to enter the data necessary to make the calculation possible. In other words, we must learn basic programs, say like physics or chemistry or mathematics, before we can understand or work with them. 
Now, this biocomputer of ours contains all of the information it has been programmed with. All the no's, don'ts, can'ts, the negative input, as well as all those experiences that produce doubts and fears. And, of course, we also hold all the positive information. But most behavioral scientists acknowledge that the balance between the two is way out of whack, meaning that the negative outweighs the positive by several times. So here we are when it comes to free will. If the data in your unconscious is not of your choosing, then when you make a choice, a fair question might be, whose choice is it? You see, I have pointed out before, until you wake up to the manipulation we're all immersed in on a 24-7 basis, you'll live your life under the illusion of free will. So the next time you think about free will versus determinism, think instead about programming. To be free, we must first acknowledge and then limit the influence of the programming. Today, there are literally thousands of little tricks that can and are used on all of us every day to guide our decisions and actions in accordance with someone else's motive. Whether to win us over to a plank at a political platform or to sell us a product or ideology, our great information age often leads us by the nose. Our only escape is to become fully aware of the means and methods. And that's precisely why I wrote my latest book, Gotcha. All right, your thoughts on this one, Ravinder? Um, You know, I find the whole aspect of the tricks that are used to guide us, as as you said. Um, You know, having read Gotcha, I'm always paying attention to those. There is not a single news report that I listen to these days that I'm not pulling apart to see, okay, they use this word for this effect. Hey, that, they're positioning that. There, you know, there isn't any news out there. That's the conclusion I come, I come to. See, everything you hear, you will see the agenda behind it. Once you have learned what these tricks and techniques are, and once you start paying attention to it. So, um, I think that, I mean, that's a huge aspect to, um, being aware in, in the world and making conscious decisions that are your own and not just being shoehorned into places. And that shoehorning goes on in loads of different areas. I think it's, it's fascinating. It has helped me a lot. That's I, what I'm saying. I posted on my Facebook page just a day before yesterday a BP service station that does an outstanding job at selling cigarettes. And when you look at the service station, you see their pylons, and the pylons are white with a brown tip. And when you look at them, they clearly look like a cigarette filter. Now, is that a prime that will initiate an action on behalf of a a smoker? Absolutely. And is it typically unconscious? Absolutely. Is it obvious? Sure. But, you know, most of this is. We just aren't alert to how it's used in order to apply our compliance. Okay, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show featured Lisa Gar, and we discussed her NDE and subsequent recovery from serious brain damage. Jenny wrote, I simply loved your show with Lisa. Her story is so genuine. Beth wrote, I do love the way that Eldon introduces us to the personal side of guests. It makes him so much more human. I have heard lots of NDE stories, but Lisa sounds a lot more cogent. Richard remarked, how lovely is this person? I do agree with that, Richard. Angela wrote, I could have listened to you two talk for hours more. Great show. Gary wrote this regarding my spotlight from last week, that of packets of information as the undergirding intelligence we can think of as our universe. Hello, Dr. Taylor. I enjoy your blog very much. The idea of information packs is fascinating to me. I'm trying to grasp the concept and we'll look more into it. Maybe hypnosis and subliminals are one way that these packets are transferred or acquired. I just wanted to thank you for your work, your show, your blog, and everything you do. Stephen wrote, Dr. Taylor, I will never be able to congratulate you enough for the system you created. Whenever I need to improve on something, your wife, Ravinder, knows what to recommend, and magic happens. When I need to overcome something, the same thing happens. I consider myself fortunate to have learned about InterTalk. I have given the website address 
to a lot of people. Recently, I gave it to two cousins after I informed them about one thing I overcame with one of the titles I bought. After a person buys one of your titles and I see them, a few weeks later they tell me, thank you so much, that system really works. I answer, no kidding. <laughs> well, thanks for your feedback and support, Stephen, and we wish you the very best of everything and all that you do. And you know who this customer is, and you do take very good care of him, and he's very happy for that. I do, but what's interesting is how many of these customers there are out there, people that have been with us all the way back. I was talking to someone else just this morning, and it's like, I've been speaking to this guy for 25 years, and he was going on. He wanted me to pass his thanks on to you for everything the Inner Talk has done for him, how it's changed his life in all of these different areas. He's every bit as happy as Steve is. That's the payday, isn't it? For it some most of those certainly long is. Nights? Absolutely. <laughs> some of those long nights, a great deal of those long <laughs> nights, they're frequent. All right, Mary wrote, I want to thank you for your book, Gotcha. It is so full of disturbing factual information that it was difficult for me to read the entire book. However, I look back now and can say this without hesitation. Without knowing what's being done to control our thoughts and beliefs, you really are at the mercy of everyone who wants to control your decisions. And after reading your book, that's almost everyone. I couldn't believe much of what I read, so I checked and double-checked, and now I just want everyone to read this book, especially my children. And Rashia wrote, Gotcha is a reminder that in a world of propaganda, we must be aware and alert and most of all prepared to act. Taylor takes us through the background and history of aspects of hypnosis and behavioral modification and demonstrates how government and big business use this knowledge for their own agendas through an almost constant flood of advertisements and doublespeak that strives to lead us like sheep. Knowledge is power, and more big business and government knows about us, the more power they have over us, giving them the ability to do anything from selling us the latest in toothpaste to gaining our acceptance of restrictive government legislations and even wars. Gotcha reminds us of how many of our rights have already been given away for the privilege of what authorities call security or safety, and how those lost freedoms may only serve to give them more power over us. Gotcha is a call to action, is a reminder that if each of us believes we cannot make a difference and don't act because our actions will be too small, then our individuality will eventually be swallowed by those who exert their influence over us. Gotcha is a thought-provoking must-read for anyone who cares about the future of humanity in the 21st century. That's quite a letter. Well, once again, folks, if you've not read Gotcha, you should. The book exists for you. I encourage you to get a copy. Go to your library, wherever. Uh, get your copy today. All right. That's all the time we're going to take for letters today. But I do invite you to opine by sending your comments to Eldon. That's E-L-D-O-N at EldonTaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. And I want to thank all of you for, for your letters and comments. We truly do appreciate your feedback and support. Now to this week's show, The Haunted House Diaries. Okay, what are your thoughts on ghosts and aliens? We've had a few guests talk. In fact, we've had today's guests discuss this before. But how about holes in space and time? Would you be surprised if evidence suggested a paranormal crossroads of sorts in the heart of Connecticut? Well, today's guest argues for just that, and he does so based on a five-decade series of personal journals and his own extensive research, interviews, and photos arising in and around the town of Litchfield Hills, Connecticut. So let me tell you a little about our guest. William J. Hall, the author of the paranormal bestseller, The World's Most Haunted House, The True Story of the Bridgeport Poltergeist on Lindy Street, returns with another profound investigation into the unknown. Hall is professionally equipped to recognize trickery, for after more than 25 years as a performing magician, he's seen most of it all. He's quick to create and recognize illusions. He's also an experienced researcher of the unexplained from folklore and urban legend to fortune-telling the pyramids and other mysterious tales. Indeed, his syndicated column, Magic and the Unknown, ran for six years in multiple newspapers. His new book has met with great reviews and many comments like this one from Brent Holland, host of the Fright Night Show. Quote, The Haunted House Diaries is, bar none, 
one of the most terrifying stories I have come across. Close quote. All right, what we need is some Twilight Zone music. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome back to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. William J. Hall. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to be back. Uh, it's indeed our pleasure. You know, some of the folks, you know, that will be listening to this show, no doubt, missed your earlier show. For them, I'd tell them, be sure and go to the archives, because your first book is a great book, too. But Thank you. For that purpose, let's do this. As you know, we like to get three things out of our guest. Who is the messenger? What is the message? And, of course, how do we use it? So to that end, William, tell us a little bit about yourself, what it was like growing up, when you got interested in, you know, ghouls and ghosts and, and the like. Uh, well, I always was a curious uh, child, uh, shy, somewhat of a dreamer, you know, laying on the grass looking up at the stars, probably stuff a lot of us used to to do more than, well, maybe more than children today. I don't know. My kids, luckily, were, were pretty outdoorsy. Uh, but in any event, um, I was always very curious, and I think that's what led me into an interest in magic because um, I was always that way. If I saw something really neat, I wanted to know more about it. Uh, and so that's really how my interest in magic evolved is when I saw something that was just boggled the mind and uh, seemed like a miracle. I want to know about it. I want to know how it worked. And, and uh, then later on, of course, it evolved into entertaining, making other people happy and, you know, the other kind of uh, values and rewards that you get from, you know, entertaining. But uh, that curiosity continued uh, with some of the TV shows growing up at the, at the time. And, uh, and then I think the big turn came uh, with my first UFO book. And uh, that was when, you know, I, I read through it and it seemed like there was something going on. But I knew you couldn't believe everything you read. So, um, you know, a buddy of mine said, well, you know, how do you know that these government documents are real? And I said, that's a good point. I'm going to order them from the government. Most people just stop there and say you can't believe it. And I said, well, there's an easy way to find out. I'll just right. order them, order them direct, you know, uh, and you know, and that was the, that was the kind of weirdo I was. Um, I'm probably in good company, <laughs> and I mean that in a good sense, weirdo. But um, and uh, from there, in UFOs, of course, it opened my mind. Well, if there's something going on here, um, as I was doing my newspaper column um, in uh, s several newspapers uh there was uh, some things that i debunked you know some uh, some fortune telling methods and and things like that some urban legends that that were false but then along the way you come across things you're like well it's that's interesting and you know ufo's was an example uh, of one of those you know pyramids and the the age of the pyramids and what they were used for you know it's another example and you know it goes on so we find um you know i found the lack of research uh, and really, uh, search for evidence, um, both sides have been guilty of. You know, people who, uh, are skeptical, and right, rightfully so, um, would quote unquote disprove things without doing their research, um, just as often or more often than other people who would believe something, you know, without any research or, or evidence. So, um, you know, we always tend to think if somebody's, uh, you know, debunking something, they're automatically right uh, because it's it's the easier outcome, right? I mean, right. it's easier it's easier to say pyramids, you know, weren't weren't uh, didn't have anything to do with aliens, <laughs> you know, and maybe they don't. But I mean, you know, it's obviously uh, easier. Um, but I found uh, uh, a lot of people who debunk things uh, had their we're guilty of the same things, you know, the same preconceived notions, the same uh, blindness, with, you know, not being objective, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and uh, so anyhow, it's kind of a long-winded answer. But that's – I was always one that, you know, wanted to go further uh, and look further and, and get the answer. So I was like a – I was like a scientist light, I guess. You know, I, did, I didn't want to do the <laughs> – I didn't want to do the physics and, and the heavy science but I was very curious and always in my life tried to go as close to the origin that I can get uh, to these things to figure them out. You know, if it's an urban legend, well, you know, how did it start? And, you know, if it started in a particular article or person, well, let me go back to that. And um, and as much as that uh, brought me resolution uh, and convinced me that, you know, a lot of things were not 
accurately report it and were not true, it also, on the other hand, convinced me that they're, uh, that it's a mysterious world out there. And, uh, and, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, a lot more than what, uh, what we tend to believe, uh, exists really does go on in the world. You're right about that argument of negation. It is very, very easy. It doesn't matter what you think about, but it's very easy to say, oh, there's no such thing as God, or there's no such thing as, um, UFOs, or there's no such, because it puts the onus back on the other person to prove otherwise. But, you know, my experience is generally when you get that kind of negation argument, when you say, well, what is your explanation for the pyramids? Well, I don't have one. <laughs> That's right. Easy. So, you know, again, you have a rather empty kind of uh, opposition. But with that said, your book tells a story that's pretty incredible, and not everyone believes it. So, I mean, indeed, there are those out there that are saying that you have either been duped or that you're telling a story uh, that's fictional. Because, I mean, after all, you're an entertainer, right? So right, right. you're just entertaining us. What do you say to people like that? Uh, um, you know, luckily I haven't come across that too often. Um, but uh, but I have, uh, I have met people, you know, in lectures. Um, one gentleman came up to me before the lecture and says, um, uh, I don't believe that uh, the dead could walk the earth. And I said, well, that's okay. You, you can believe in the paranormal without believing that. That's actually just one theory. You know, the, the one theory is ghosts or spirits of the dead, uh, but, but we don't know that. You know, quantum physics would give a different explanation. Uh, and we're many years off from coming to that conclusion, or both may be true, or both may be false, and it might be something else that we don't even know about yet. You know, we, we don't know. I said, so you might still enjoy the lecture nevertheless, because you could believe that ghosts are not spirits of the dead and still believe and understand the paranormal. Um, so, you know, I've said things like that. The other thing I said is, you know, I respect anybody who says, I don't believe in that. I don't think any belief should be... Should be um, arrived at unless you do your own um, due diligence, whether that's through reading or whatever it is. And, and I would, you know, my, my first book, which is based on just a lot of witness testimony, I did have people who said, I don't believe in this stuff. And they read the book and came to me afterwards and said, you know, I'm still, I, I still don't know. But let me tell you, um, your book really gave me more evidence than I've ever seen before. Um, because I you know, believe you were telling the truth. Obviously, that's got to be a number one. I mean, uh, if I'm not telling the truth, I should have wrote the book more like Stephen King, you know, and I'm, maybe, I, maybe I'd have a movie like the Amityville Horror, you know what I mean? Right. But, uh, right. yeah, I mean, but the, you know, that's really what I, what I say to people when they said they don't believe it, you know, is, you know, your first thing you ask them is, well, what, what do you know about it or what have you investigated? You know, for, for, as, as a magician, I mean, when I was performing, I used to get asked everywhere, what do you think about this haunted house? What do you, you think about it? And I would, my answer was always the same. You know what? I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't investigated it. And I say the same thing today. People say, well, what about this place over here? Do you believe that's haunted? And I said, here's the way I work. I don't believe anything is anything until either I investigate it myself. Or I know and trust others who have. And, and there are a lot of others that I have. And there's, there's other books that I read and I believe, you know, like the Enfield Poltergeist case, you know, I, right. I've read that book and I, I believe that's an honest, uh, you know, account of it and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so, but otherwise, if I haven't been there myself, you know, if somebody comes up to me and says, well, I'm a psychic, I mean, uh, I, I would be, I would tend more to disbelieve it until, uh, I see otherwise. Yeah, the evidence the other. I've yes. told you on that. We have a break coming up. When we come back, though, I'm going to ask you, I mean, doesn't this stuff ever scare you? All right, we're speaking with William Hall about his life, research, and new book, The Haunted House Diaries. To learn more about William, visit his website at William J. Hall Author. As one word, William J. Hall Author dot com. Okay, remember to join Ravinder in the chat room. You can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, 
or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I use InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your InnerTalk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. And welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with William Hall about his life research and new book, The Haunted House Diaries. To learn more about William, again, visit his website at williamjhallauthor.com. Now, we ask our guests for three pieces of music, three of their favorites, music that has some genuine significance to them. And as you know, music is more important to us than many recognize. It can awaken forgotten memories, has restored lost states of consciousness, and indeed is often used in the field of psychology when evaluating such things as human aptitude, skill, intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. All right, William, you know the gig on this one. Your first choice was Two Princes by the Spin Doctors. So tell us, you know, what makes this important to you? Uh, Well, it's it's a... William? Yes. Have we lost our guest? Oh, could you hear me? Hello? Is that you, sir? You're back with us. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, nothing changed on my end that I know of, but (laughs) you can hear me now, right? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you great. We must have a little bit of engineering uh, difficulty. No no problem. (laughs) But that's all right. You heard the music. Why that? Uh, well, you know, they're, they're, it's just a great, uh, great song, a great band. Uh, incidentally, what, um, Beside, you know, I always liked them, and what really heightened it is I got to see them, uh, not in their height of their popularity, but a few years ago with with uh, when my son was uh, younger and he was learning the drums, and uh, we went up afterwards. They told everybody to come to the stage, and um, I got his ticket autographed by all of them, and and uh, my son, who was much smaller at the time, probably like nine or eight said i'm learning um two two princes and the drummer came forward and said that's great i'll show you how it goes and he spent about um eight minutes or ten minutes which is a very long time uh teaching him wow and and uh and this and that's so that's one reason the other reason is the singer actually lost his voice for almost a year and um didn't know if he'd ever be able to talk again and uh and uh he uh he was very thankful for you know re- regaining his ability to do that and through therapy and stuff uh you know he said he sings better now than ever uh but uh he told the audience that um you know he's very very happy um to be there that this is not work for them this is fun they're just really good people good guys uh, very humble, and they're amazing musicians. Uh, so there's a multitude of reasons, and uh, unfortunately, they couldn't repeat the success uh, of their first album, as as is sometimes uh, the case. But very, very talented, uh, and very, very good people. Uh, humble, and uh, as I learned, uh, very caring and appreciative. So yes, that's really a cool story. The Spin Doctors. All right. I told you before the break, I was going to ask you, do you ever just get, you know, become fearful of some of this stuff that you look into? I mean, does it frighten you? 
Uh, I would say generally no, um, not because I'm brave, though. Uh, <laughs> I happen to be um, taught by uh, two very, um, very, very good uh, paranormal investigators, uh, Paulino and uh, Shane Searway. And um, uh, Shane in particular, uh, who I call like the trifecta of the paranormal, and he was heavily involved in, in this case with the Haunted House Diaries, uh, I say trifecta because he was a Native American shaman. He had a near-death experience, and he grew up in a haunted house. So <laughs> if he goes in the place and doesn't feel anything, just pack up and leave. Um, but uh, so, you know, both those uh, gentlemen are dear friends of mine. Uh, they really uh, taught me uh, the way that these things work and that these uh, negative kind of haunts, uh, they follow the same kind of rules. Uh, and, and you get rid of them the same way and they tend to start the same way, uh, which is not a big secret to a lot of investigators it has to do with the type of energy you're sending out and, you know, the kind of the frequency and, um, and these parasites as, as we call them tend to be attracted to that kind of thing. Uh, but knowing that and learning their limitations and that you're, you're in control and could uh, get rid of them. And also, of course, knowing I have good friends who could, if I can't, um, you know, that takes away a lot of the fear. That's not to say if I go into a very, you know, I went into, there was one case, uh, went on and, uh, Shane was still in his truck and, uh, and I had opened the door and, the, and the, nobody's lived in the house for about a year and, you know, it's empty and dark and cold and you're going in by yourself and it's supposed to be a real nasty uh, pass to, to the, the haunt and stuff. Um, so yeah, you're a little bit, uh, weirded out going in, but, um, you know, that's not to say that I would, you know, run for the hills if I heard a noise or saw anything. Um, I think understanding it, uh, takes a lot of that way. Um, that being said, Obviously, if objects are flying around, you'd be scared because something could hit you in the head. <laughs> you know, paranormal or not, that's something to watch yeah. out for. Uh, and the other thing, I think uh, I would be a lot more apprehensive and afraid if I knew it was UFO related because, you know, abduction experiences uh, sometimes are great for people and sometimes they're nightmares. So that, I think, unlike a quote unquote, you know, ghost or, or you know, that kind of paranormal experience um, where it's less where they can damage you, but it's psychological damage. Not that that can't be harmful, of course, obviously, and you know that, you know. But uh, but if you understand it, 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 it of course, uh, you know, that's something you can avoid. Whereas, uh, you know, if it's an alien abduction, that, that would be scary because you don't know if you're going to have the friendly, enlightening you know, religious encounter, whether you're, you're you know, whether you're going to be right. experimented on, you know, so, so that kind of thing would be different. But generally in, in the case of hauntings, uh, uh, you know, I would say no, except for the, you know, the initial going into a dark place. Um, but, um, but, you know, understanding what it's about, I think is really what, what has helped, you know, some people, if they hear footsteps, they yell demon and run. And so I think, if you don't know the nature, just like anything else, right? I mean, fear of the unknown is the biggest fear. So if you know a little bit about something, how it works, even if we don't have all the answers, and that's okay, but if we kind of understand the mechanics of it, it certainly uh, makes you able to approach it um, with a different mindset. All right, let's let's talk a little about your book. In, in fact. It opens with a disclaimer that some might imply to be but a form of a cover-up. You state, and I'll quote, The farmhouse in this book is real. It is a private residence and is not open to the public. Under no circumstances are the residents to be contacted directly by anyone for any reason related to the house or their story. All direct contact will be refused and ignored. Any inquiries by anyone for any purpose should be directed to. And, of course, you go on that you own the exclusive rights to the story and you act as a liaison for the family. Did you pay the residents for their story, William? And if you did, do you think that that may have led to any exaggerations, confabulations, or the like on behalf of the residents? Uh, no, they have not uh, profited uh, f from the book at all. Um, that was done because um, Donna 
had decided to use her real name and you know we Paul and I had discussed it with her concern because you know it's, it's always can use your real name you know somebody could visit the house I didn't think a lot of people would but you know um, you want to be mindful of that and kind of coach them the best you can on it and and she had decided no I'll use my real name because I want people to understand it's real uh, so that was really the reasoning um, behind that you know doing it doing it to protect the family there was nothing that Donna wrote um, at the time I mean everything that was written diary wise was done uh, well before there was ever a book involved and you know I, I saw the original papers that it was all written on and uh, clearly they were old you know it wasn't like she just gave me a type actually she gave me a typed out binder of, of all the entries and then said first time I met her and said Mr. Hall I, I don't want you to think I just made this all up let me bring out the box and she brought out a box and, and it was just filled with all these papers backs of envelopes uh, you know the yellow you know, Manila school papers, you know, just mm -hmm. writing notes and entries on, on papers as she goes about her normal life going back, you know, 50 years. So, um, and then we stayed in the house, you know, we investigated it and stayed in the house. So it wasn't like we just took her word, but, uh, but Donna has, uh, repeatedly, I mean, she's not a person who exaggerates. She's a person who looks for other reasons. Um, and she's done that, you know, throughout the years, although, you know, you have to remember, I mean, six generations of her family, her family name, you know, lived there. Uh, and as far back as anybody rem could remember, there's been um, those accounts. Uh, and I interviewed uh, many people in the family um, individually. So, uh, you know, so I had no doubt her, her story was, was true. Um, but that was just a starting point because um, I knew that uh, if it's going to be written – uh, we have to gather evidence for ourselves. We have to stay in the house. Uh, you know, we need audio, photos, a video if possible. And we ended up getting uh, all of those things uh, throughout the duration of the case. And uh, it's kind of like a one-stop shopping mall for the paranormal there. And luckily, it's not really a negative kind of – I mean, a lot, to a lot of people, it would be negative. And I can't tell you if I would have stayed in the house, you know, based on – what they went through, uh, maybe not out of fear, maybe just annoyance or, you know, who knows? It's always tough to say what you will do, you know, or <laughs> versus what you would do. But, uh, you know, she grew up with the paranormal. So for her, it was very much, uh, you know, almost like her culture was much different than the normal Western, you know, mindset, you know. Right. All right. So for our audience, so they understand who Donna is, give us a little background on Donna, uh, if you will. I mean, obviously she grew up in the home and it's six generations there. How much of the book is based on her work? Uh, well, the book is, uh, is in three parts. Um, one is, is the uh, diary entries and uh, they have been edited and rewritten by myself. And the reason for that is when you write a diary, not change, but when you write a diary entry, you don't necessarily describe everything. And um, so there's certain points I knew that readers would want to know or expand upon or ask. Uh, and it's easy to tell what that is because, of course, I would have the same question. So, you know, I would ask her, when you say, you know, there was handwriting on the note, what, you know, did you see the note? What kind of writing was it? You know, what, what appeared? You know, you'd ask for those right. kind of clarification questions that, you know, to make sure that, uh, you're giving the reader the, you know, the full story. And then on top of that, too, I mean, Donna wrote this over the years, um, from her perspective. Um, and so I wanted to interview if it involved other people. I wanted to say, well, do you remember that? And, you know, and, you know, Donna mentioned that this happened to you and you told her about it. Could you tell me about that? You know, and, and so to, to get those stories out of it. So, uh, you know, I interviewed her daughter, for example, and, and there's, uh, parts about her daughter's, uh, experiences that, was not part of the original diary. So that's one part of the book. And then uh, the second part is about other things that happen in the area, you know, some of the other uh, haunted houses and uh, and uh, just general phenomena, uh, a secret or not so secret anymore, underground military base nearby, 
um, many UFO sightings, things of that nature. And then the third part is, um, you know, the investigation, you know, what we found mm-hmm. and, uh, and discussions around it. What are our paranormal assumptions that we make? Um, and how we're guilty of, uh, you know, we see and interpret everything through our own context and experience and how we have to, you know, constantly, um, you know, question ourselves about that. And the discussion and uh, analysis of it is uh, interesting because it's a lot of fun, of course, to um, to present the evidence and then sit around and, t- you know, what does that mean to you or what does that what does that appear to be? Does that appear to be a time slip? Does that appear to be, you know, uh, somebody telling the future, you know, or and, and just talk about it? Because some of the things, of course, we don't know what it is. I mean, we can pretend and say, oh, well, this is definitely this. And some people will do that. But I think um, um, when you get into reasonings and motives, uh, uh, you got to be careful. You know, we sometimes assign emotion, for example, to a feeling. I was doing a lecture one time and somebody said, um, that they were in this house with a paranormal group, and they knew it was uh, an evil spirit because uh, two of them felt sick, and, and and so it was very negative. And I said, well, "Why is sickness negative?" You know, I mean, we, we're we're assigning an emotion to sickness. It's not a, a you know we don't like it. We don't like to feel sick, but sick is an evil you know what i mean so we right. we assign emotion you know and and uh, it turns out like in that case that they're talking about they're you know if you have electromagnetic energy coming through a water pipe or whatever you know i mean those things can make you feel sick and and historically a lot of people would interpret those kinds of uh, natural phenomena that cause you to feel sick as oh it's something evil and now i feel sick and mm-hmm. uh and sickness is not something uh, evil. It's not something that I, I don't want to be sick. But, you know, again, so uh, and we're all guilty of that. So we have to constantly be very careful um, to not assign uh, motives. You know, we assume that uh, different entities have the same motives as we do. And, you know, so those are all very difficult uh, uh, things. And, um, the you know, example I, I love to use is, uh, when we look at in- insects and why they do things or why animals do things, we'll, oh, we'll often assign, um, uh, you know, human motivations. Like when I, mo- if I mow the lawn and, and gnats are attacking my face, I think they're mad at me because I disturbed their, their <laughs> living area. Right. Isn't that funny? Because you really yeah. think that way. And then I found out, and this wasn't that long ago, because I never really looked it up and then one time i'm gonna look it up i wonder why these gnats attack my head you know it's like they're they know i'm invading their home and it turns out it's carbon dioxide they're going after it's 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 the breath that that's escaping that they're attracted to they're actually not mad at me at all (laughs) you know but we assign (laughs) you know we we assign human motivations to everything because it's it's hard to see from a different or unknown point of view you know we we tend to course go uh, by our experiences, just like ants have a room for their dead, um, but it's not the same kind of thing that we do as humans. But you know, we we say, "Oh, look, they're they're compassionate. They have a room." For-. No, that's not why they do it. So, um, so again, in the paranormal, you know, if we we make those mistakes, even just with normal natural phenomena uh even though i think of course paranormal is normal and natural phenomena it's just stuff that we don't understand quite quite yet um but you know so that's uh, i think you know uh, that's the third part is you know a lot of the discussion around that so anyhow long right, well, answer to that but <laughs> no that's, that's that's great no i like your answers and i love how the book has been organized but you lead me to something you've written in your book it's a quote by Michael Shermer, and Shermer says, quote, Mysteries once thought to be supernatural or paranormal happenings, such as astronomical or meteorological events, are incorporated into science once their causes are understood. I, I assume that the reason you put this quote in is you understand what was going on in this house. Um, well, I mean, I have... A theory, but I mean, the reason the quote is there is because I think even the things that we don't understand, um, are not quote unquote magic. They are all normal. 
they're just uh, things that don't occur everywhere all the time, and we don't fully understand them. Uh, so, you know, the best theory, um, the paranormal could be explained quite simply uh, using quantum physics and, and, you know, quantum theory, because it, it really matches. Um, would I bet my life on it? Well, no, right? I mean, we're, we're a long way from understanding um, what multiple universes mean and what quantum and everything there is about quantum physics. Well, whether uh, I think or not it, they even exist. I mean, we've got two physicists in my family, one yeah. a Cambridge graduate and uh, the other one at the University of Washington, and they would say all this stuff is just foo-foo. Uh, physics doesn't prove that. Not to say that it's not real, but that physics doesn't prove it. So uh, I understand what you're saying. I guess where I want to go is uh, you have some theories. Let's deal with your theories. Let's see if we can tie some things together. Because, again, I love how your book is is laid out. Oh, thank uh, you. William, uh, what, what relevance, that's maybe the way to start, what relevance is there to black ops and underground military bases uh, with respect to this house? Uh, not there is none with respect to the actual house, other than there has been um, UFO alien related phenomena uh, inside the house and and within the paranormal flap. There's quite a lot of UFO sightings uh, in that area. And uh, matter of fact, if you follow the road all the way down into New York, you get to the Hudson Valley. You know, UFO sightings where that took place. No, um, I, I so, have to stop because somebody in the, I mean, the chat room, they're already saying, what's the paranormal flap? Ah, good, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, paranormal flap is, uh, simply put, just an area, uh, that, you know, we roughly look at the area. There's no, of course, lines or you step over the sidewalk and there's no more paranormal. It's, you know, it's a haunted world, but, um, but it's, an area that has a heightened paranormal activity. Uh, so, for example, this farmhouse is not the only house in the area that it experiences phenomena. There's many houses that do. Certainly not the same or to the extent and, and variety that this house does, but um, but the land in, in general, um, Bermuda Triangle, I guess, would be the easiest way. Bermuda Triangle is probably the most popular, um, quote-unquote, paranormal flap. Um, but that's, that's what a flap is. It's just a term that we use for an area that has a heightened level of paranormal activity. And we tend to see a variety of that activity, not just UFOs, not just ghosts, not just Bigfoot, but we tend to see a mixture of those things. Um, and we're learning that those things, uh, it's not like they all know each other, but they're kind of all on the same bus, if you will. Um, which, uh, which makes, um, you know, multiple universes, uh, an interesting uh, theory for that. By the way, most physicists do believe there's multiple universes. What they disagree on or what they don't know, and obviously we don't know how many years before they know, is what it means. What does it mean to have multiple universes? You know, what does that mean for us? And, yeah, you know, and, and how does it work? Or and how does it, right, or, right. How does it work? And there are experiments uh, actually within the last two years uh, that are uh, – Really, come, in the last two years, we came uh, big leaps forward with experiments not even possible as, as, uh, as uh, you know, in the 80s and stuff, um, with proving certain parts of it. But again, you know, we're, we're a long way off, right? I mean, we're, uh, there's many, uh, I'm sure it's going to evolve and we're going to learn many fascinating things. Uh, the question would be, is it, is it a year from now or 500 years? You know, we don't know. So. And a large part of it challenges existing paradigms, and that will, you oh, know, have its own right. push in delaying things. We all you, we know how that works. My, I, I'm going to oh. ask you to hold it, William, because we've got a break coming. Sure. Uh, but when we come back from the break, let's pick it up and 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 tell us, you know, paranormal flap. What is this paranormal crossroad? Why is it exist? where it is in Connecticut, based on what you think, what you know. If you'd like to know more about William Hall and his new book, The Haunted House Diaries, visit his website at williamjhallauthor.com. It's one word, williamjhallauthor.com. Now, we have a video for you during the break featuring our guests discussing hauntings. 
Just go to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. A silent battle has been raging for the territory of your mind. Like a virulent virus, the effects are spreading. In Gotcha, Eldon Taylor explores the 24-7 bombardment of information designed to manage your thinking. He demonstrates how new sound bites are championed into personal awareness, becoming memes of the culture. And this results in framing and reframing classical positions, causing adjustments to personal values and history itself. Your every decision process is being managed and manipulated. Gotcha exposes the arrival of the Orwellian age in full-blown technicolor. In laying bare the current uses of the many sophisticated techniques, Eldon reveals what it is we need to do in order to avoid allowing others to puppet our thoughts. For details, go to eldentaylor.com backslash gotcha. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. We're chatting with William Hall about his life, research, and new book, The Haunted House Diaries. Now, William, your second musical choice, Santa Monica by Everclear. What's the story with this one? Uh, it happens to just be a song I like. But as far as the band, I think uh, uh, Alex, you know, the lead singer and writer, uh, is just a, a great example of somebody who has a, uh, a rough childhood and... Uh, really writes a lot of songs that reflects uh, the culture uh, that he grew up in or, or you know, the surroundings and things that happened to him. And um, there is something that uh, that he said on the back of one of his, one of their early uh, releases, which said, uh, I'd, we'd like to thank all the, uh, all the kids in school who argued about with other people about how great we are. We, we appreciate that, <laughs> which I thought was cute. Uh, but again, I think it's a, it, it's a great story of somebody who has nothing and, um, you know, was playing in the garage and I used to be in a band and that's, you know, we used to, the cliche play, you know, playing in the garage and, uh, and they ended up taking leaps and, and, and made it. And, uh, uh, although they never, um, he never lost the uh, the impact of being humble. So an- another nice guy. It's great. Uh, what what did you play? Your son plays the drums. What did you play? Uh, I played bass and uh, I also pl- played guitar to write. I, I wrote a lot of songs. So I was a um, uh, I consider myself probably a better writer than than a musician. Uh, but uh, but you know I, I played well and we played in the eighties and. Uh, around the 90s and then of course you know with children and everything you know so do you, you you got a little orchestra there in your own family did your wife play <laughs> <laughs> no no actually my son gave up uh, the drums but uh but yeah but he but he uh he had some fun with it uh, in the meantime and my older yeah. son uh actually took up the ukulele which is which is um which quite surprised me but was really cool so, but yeah. as you know, as you mentioned, you know, just uh, love music and, and and magic. I mean, it's they're universal languages, right? I mean, they're, you don't need to. They uh, are. Yeah. So. Oh, very true. All right. So we have a paranormal crossroad in a little town in Connecticut. I mean, you know, what? What? Why? Why the UFO activity? Why all this paranormal activity? What? What makes this area? I mean, is it, you know, what, some kind of uh, electromagnetic hotspot or? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you hit it. We know it involves electromagnetic energy. Uh, in this particular area uh, of the land or this house in particular, um, yes, there, you know, in, in, in the whole flap area, there's there's stuff going on. But this house in particular happens to be surrounded by water flow on three sides which we find is a commonality um 
and to say why that is, I'd be lying if I know. <laughs> um, you know, it's different people say, you know, minerals or, you know, electric magnetic energy has to do with the water. I haven't heard explanations that to me doesn't mean they're not out there, but that to me makes, um, sense based on, you know, what we know. It's just a commonality that we do find. I can are understand. They, like, are these underground rivers or are they exposed rivers? Is no, it fast these, moving water or? Uh, these are, these are exposed, uh, not fast moving, doesn't have to be. Actually, in the Bridgeport Poltergeist case, there was an underground spring, for example. So it could be uh-huh. underground or, you know, but we tend to find that, uh, um, that it is a commonality. Uh, although that's not, obviously, there's a mix of ingredients here. That's not the only thing. And uh, I'm sure there's ingredients that make this happen that we haven't discovered yet. Uh, I mean, we we know it sounds cliche. We know it's Native American land, but I don't think that's why. I don't think that's why there is a flap there. I think it's the opposite. Uh, Native American people, as uh, Shane, being a shaman, has explained to me, um, Native Americans didn't go and open these portals or whatever. They went and found places that already had that kind of setup, that kind of energy. But and, this wasn't a burial ground or some sacred energy, or it was? Well, uh, he said that that particular land uh, definitely was was guarded by uh, that, you know, that they would, they would find these places because they wanted to, quote unquote, commune with the spirits. Right. And, and that um, these, uh, these there are entities that you can, and witchcraft has done this too and stuff. So the, the, the correctness or reality of their beliefs doesn't really matter as much as the fact that they're communicating. And for some reason, these things will actually, you know, guard the land. Uh, Paul calls them like the good Samaritans of the paranormal. They just happen to like do volunteer work or so it's just, it's bizarre and, it, and it's, uh, it's really hard to understand. No, um, I, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I've heard about some of these William, you know, vortex areas where you might yeah, have, yeah. uh, you, you might have a, a piece of ground that's six foot by six foot that you can't grow anything in no matter what you try to do, but the ground all around it grows. Is there anything at all like that in, in this area? Uh, not in that, not, uh, what you're describing. Um, it, it, very likely that there's burial ground around there, but uh, you know, Shane explained uh, Native Americans. It's not like they get mad at certain things like that, but there are those um, those guardian spirits, if you will. And like I said, witchcraft has invoked that too. It's not because witchcraft is real; it's because they're they're talking or paying attention and talking to those things where there are these. Vortex, another word for flap portal, you know, whatever you want to right. call it. So, right. yeah. Um, but no, there's no particular area as far as not growing things, um, you know, in that example there. Um, and, uh, but, it, you know, as Shane said, uh, you know, the, the families clearly accept it. You know, if you put a dysfunctional family in that house, you, of course, would be attracting, uh, things, um, to the house that were very negative, you know, like those negative parasites we talked about earlier. But, right. uh, but this family really has, you know, the right attitude and, uh, and they have experienced both, uh, ancestors, you know, family members, uh, people who lived in the house prior, as well as unknown entities, you know, little, uh, figure with pointed ears, that kind of thing, you know, just weird, odd figures. Um, some that look like, uh, well, what, Paul calls clerics because they kind of look like they're robed and, uh, and they seem to be, um, almost like protective and watchful and benign. At least that's what they, these are all, of course, our theories and conclusions by observation. You know, we could be, of course, completely wrong with some of these things. You just try to, um, you know, make sense of it or, or, or at least put forth a, a few things based on what you observe. Um, but as far as, well, how did the, you know, how did the flap get there in the first place? Um, sometimes those flaps could be created like in Gettysburg by some, 
you know, big event like war or death or that kind of thing. Right. They don't, ne- they don't necessarily have to be. So I think the answer is, you know, you can give some examples, but we really don't know exactly. Like in this case, I, I couldn't really, uh, the best I can say is, um, you know, the land itself, whether it's, you know, ley lines or, um, the water or a combination of those things. Um, I know in, in the Bridgeport Poltergeist case, for example, what, uh, that was a perfect storm of, uh, power lines, underground st- springs, sandy soils, high water tables, but probably nothing would have happened if you didn't throw dysfunctional family in there. So, uh, and there might be some ingredients that we have discovered yet you know like everything else so yeah uh so you you don't think i mean this is attracted to the ground the general area and and if 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 i stay for a second with that as you know the operating assumption what is is it the same i mean does this kind of field this vortex is that what attracts ufo activity as well not just you know the ghosts and you know whatever however we want to think about those on the other side whether they're guardians or they're you know um their intent is less you know magnanimous i suppose uh is that what brings the ufos in i mean do we find a commonality with ufos and vortexes around the world uh, I, I would say, uh, yes. It, it, uh, you know, many, many years ago, uh, I think this is prob- probably one of the bigger advances that we've made in the, in, you know, researching, you know, the paranormal. Uh, years ago, you know, the, uh, um, the UFO people didn't want to talk to the ghost people because, you know, the ghost people were stupid and, and nobody wanted to talk to Bigfoot people because they're out of their minds and, you know, and right. so, uh, that, you know, I'm being a little facetious, but, you know, they, we, we more or less operated in silos. You know, somebody would say, well, I believe in UFOs, but, you know, I don't believe in ghosts at all. You know, that yeah, kind keep of thing. those other crazy folks away from me. <laughs> for away <laughs> from me. Yeah. Right. 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 But now, uh, we're hearing, you know, you go to UFO con- conference and uh, you will hear about ghosts. Why? Because it's hard to really separate them. We're finding commonality with all these things. We're fi- in fact, um, I was at a conference last year and I, I believe the figure was about it. It was in the eighties. I think it was 83% of the time when they have a lot of UFO activity, they find there's also uh, haunted houses so you know uh, that's like a bizarre connection you know in the case right. of uh the haunted house diaries in that flap area there's a long history of bigfoot sightings ufo sightings uh as well as uh haunting so you have a bit of everything so my best you know theory right now like i said when <laughs> wouldn't bet my life on it but if if the multiverse uh, theory or this or this one theory of the multiverse is true, the many worlds kind of theory, um, or if it's something different, time, dimension, whatever, uh, then you can argue that maybe these things are coming through. We don't know why they bleed over or why portals. these portals are there or whatever. Uh, but uh, as, I, as I said, maybe they don't necessarily, quote, unquote, interact with each other, but maybe they're traveling the same way, and that would explain why UFOs can disappear, why, uh, why sometimes uh, we see a spirit and they think they're being haunted, we think we're being haunted, you know, uh, and some ghosts are not spirits of the dead because uh, in rare cases, but there are cases where uh, people have met the living people that are haunting their home as a spirit. So then you're like, well, what is that? Is that a parallel world intersect and some sort of, you know, how yeah. do you, how do you interpret that? You know, is that yeah. a time slip? Is that, you know, so it gets into a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, questions and, um, you know, quantum physics. Yeah. I mean, it seems to have the best theory, but you know, I, you know, we, we all know how, um, you know, wrong we've been before with theories, uh, both science and us as humans, we've always been pretty bad at, um, which is not a bad thing. It's just, you know, we've been it bad is, at, yeah. at seeing what's beyond the horizon. I mean, if you right. took a, 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 a medieval person and, and had a time machine and took them here, I mean, uh, they wouldn't know what hit them. I mean, the stuff we have today is, is, is unbelievable. So it's no doubt we're 
you're going to discover a lot more. I think you brought up a great point about, uh, you know, the par- our beliefs and our, our paradigm and all that. We're getting to a level of science that's so sophisticated that even w- no matter how much evidence there is, it, it's very hard for us non well, it's hard right now. It's hard for physicists even to under, <laughs> understand a lot of it. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, but for non-physicists, it's very hard for us because we're talking about things that are way out there. You know, like when when a car was invented, you could say, "Look, I see the car. It's running. I get it. It exists." Yeah, they I defy don't, common I, sense, right? Right. Yeah, I don't quite understand how it works, but it doesn't matter. There it is going, and I get it. But now, when you talk multiple universes. It, it, it's it really boggles the mind. I mean, we could understand it, but I think um, uh, you know that's I think makes it even uh, tougher. It's not something like an atom. Oh, we're made of atoms. Okay, so what? It doesn't really think, impact me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's still good. But multiple universes, then that's kind of a weird. You know, the, it it redefines our reality. Yeah, and it gets weirder when you get into it, because if you think of multiple universes like two or three or ten or twenty in some limited form, well, right. that's more manageable than when you really understand that what's being said is, if I could have turned left, but I turned right, some in some universe I turned left. And yes. so every time every one of us make any, any kind of a decision, and suddenly we have this infinite possibility of and I'm going to put it in quotation marks, universes, and, and that's just mind-boggling. That's it, It's beyond our ability to comprehend, and so we reject it or we are amused by it, but it's not something we seriously entertain. But I am really interested in this correspondence between the UFO community and, and the hauntings and the ghosts, the paranormal, uh, vortexes. What do they have in common? I mean, what what can we say that you know? Obviously, there's a different electromagnetic uh, field than what you find in a normal or what we consider to be our average uh, Earth plateau. Uh, but what can we say that's in common that would maybe make them thinner, or or possibly a conduit, or a portal, or or have you looked at that at all, William? Uh, as far as you mean what can get rid of a portal? Is yeah, that no, 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 no. What, yeah. You see, look, like you said, Gettysburg. Right, uh, right. You see that right away. There are so many people that died on that field. It is it's right. such a horror, a blight in the history of you know of our country and, and such sadness and terror and everything else that you can imagine attached to Gettysburg, including right, right. honor, nobility, courage, and so, whoa, you know, when you put those kinds of opposites together, you're going to get, you know, this vortex. But that's a different kind of vortex, isn't it, than a vortex whose ley lines due to the energy, uh, electromagnetic currents. Uh, and, and so I'm asking, is there anything in common that would attract the UFOs as much as, say, the, the ghosts and the ghouls? to these these vortexes um i would interpret that they're not being well actually i mean maybe they are maybe maybe the energy maybe they're attracted to them because they're that's the modality that they use um you know the way they get around uh or maybe they're not attracted to them but that's how they travel so in other words attracted maybe that's how they they so go the mechanic to, to you're leave saying and may come, well be the energy. Come and go. Yeah. So, so you're saying the mechanic may well be the energy. It doesn't matter if it's a man-created energy or a natural earth-created energy. It's an energy. Right. Right. I, I, I would tend to. Th- although you're right. I mean, it could be consciously created, but, uh, um, and and maybe they know how to do that, right? If you know how to go between dimensions or universes or whatever, whatever you know, you can label it whatever way you want because we don't really yeah. know, uh, then maybe it is consciously created. Um, but because of the variety of phenomena, you know, because it's not always UFOs that are, you know, near a portal, I mean, often there's mixed, you know, uh, paranormal occurrences like in uh, Skinwalker Ranch and like in, the you know, the 
haunted house diaries area. But um, because it's not always everything, then um, to me it seems like it's more of a natural occurrence. Or maybe it's a combination, right? I mean, maybe it's part of the time it's enhanced or created, and other times it occurs naturally. And that, of course, would be you know, six million dollars, seven million dollar question with inflation. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay. There are a lot of conspiracies always attached to UFOs. We have had some, you know, uh, prominent people, the Canadian uh, defense minister step out and say, you know, look, it's, it's, it's real, but we, we also have a government that denies it. I, I guess my question is more in line with some of the conspiracy theories. And, you know, if you have, uh, it, it's an opinion I'm looking for from you, William. If you mm-hmm. know more than that, well, of course, great. But do you believe that our government understands these areas that attract UFOs and create bases or operations in those areas for purposes that would be somehow connected to the ufo activity i i think that uh i think the government um knows some uh but i think they're very far off in uh knowing a lot obviously i mean i think that uh that we would mill it you know we would make it uh we would weaponize it you know, the best we could and we would enhance it. Some of our enhancements may in fact come from, you know, the Roswell crash, that kind of thing. But right. I think we're, we're still, I think, far off, uh, from that. And some of the, the evidence I, I would use to that point, uh, would be, uh, I mean, I would compare government documents to newspaper articles. So, uh, and see what the government said about, uh, witnesses compared to what they said, you know, in, in the, classified documents, top secret documents that are now declassified. Um, so for somebody to say they weren't lying, well, you know, they were. Now, of course, most people today would not find it hard to believe that we don't get all the truth, you know, right. <laughs> or that we only get a portion of the truth. You know, I'm, I'm not yeah. a big conspiracy guy, but I mean, it's just, it's just the way things are. Uh, but the other indication that they really are very far off, or at least were very far off, uh, was, I think it was in the 60s, uh, there's a government document I have, it's a very thick, uh, document, and, uh, we tried to build a UFO. You know, which is funny. The government says, oh, no such thing as you. Well, why did we try to build one then? Right. You know what I mean? We yeah. tried, to, and, and I, it was, uh, some sort of hovercraft that we tried to build, uh, it was built, uh, it worked horribly, it wasn't stable, uh, but we were trying to mimic, you know, uh, I believe what we had found. Our understanding. Uh, yeah, and it was, uh, because it was miserable and because, uh, the project was a failure, uh, my guess is that we really haven't <laughs> learned enough from, uh, whatever information that we had from, uh, you know, Roswell and, and Aztec crash, um, so that, you know, that's my opinion on it. So I think I, I do, we do, do find the military tends to be around, you know, uh, you know, when, where these things are, they tend to, you know, like the, the military base here, I'm not saying that they form that base because of the flap, but they tend to, uh, you know, poke their nose around flap areas, you know. Interesting uh, coincidence anyway that the, that you do yeah. find them in all these areas. All right. Well, we have another break coming. So, when we come back, uh, I, I, I want to discuss some of the very specific incidents that you share in your book, like the Philly farmhouse phenomena, maybe the St. Bernard incident, or those that you find to be, you know, the most compelling. So I'll give you a bit of an opportunity to refresh on that one, if you will, William. We're glad you tuned in today. We know you have many choices, and we're grateful you chose to join us. We love your feedback, so please join me on Facebook and or drop me an email at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at eldontaylor.com. I love sharing your letters and comments on the show, and that's a great way for you to participate. We'll be right back following this short break. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. What is one thing you wish you could change about yourself? What if you could make that change happen with the click of a button? With InnerTalk, Eldon Taylor's patented and scientifically proven and effective technology, change begins to happen the moment you hit play. InnerTalk works by priming how you talk to yourself, and when your inner self-talk aligns with your outer goals, anything becomes possible. 
Visit www.innertalk.com to find your towel today. Hi, I'm Eldon Taylor, and you're listening to Provocative Enlightenment Radio. I'm so glad you could join me as we tackle those tough questions in search of the answers that really matter. But remember, this is a journey we are undertaking together, so I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Please send your comments to Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at eldontaylor.com. You can also join in the conversation by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor, that's D-R-E-L-D-O-N-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Now, back to the show. Sometimes I feel like I am drunk. Welcome back. We've been chatting with William Hall about his life research and new book, The Haunted House Diaries. In this half hour, we'll take your call. So if you have questions, give us a call or adventure comments and questions in our chat room. And remember, I love your feedback, and a great place for that is on Facebook. So I invite you to join me there again. And I, I want to plug this book, The Haunted House Diaries. It's really very well done. And if you can't tell by listening to our guests, it's really open-minded, uh, it, it is an honest investigation, and uh, there, you know, there are a lot of claims about these sorts of things out there, but very few honest investigations. A great read, The Haunted House Diaries. All right, William, your third musical choice is Out of My Head by Fastball. I know you're going to tell me that this is a great group and da 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 da, but those are pretty interesting lyrics, and you're certainly not immune to them, are you? No, no. In fact, I don't. I don't know any about anything about those people, so <laughs> so we're safe. <laughs> okay. No, so um, no, this is a, a, an emotional song for me. I mean, I, I think it's very pretty, but it's also uh, reminds me uh, to. I don't know if this is what they meant by it, but as far as meaning for me, that uh, to never take uh, advantage or take somebody for granted, you know, that you've been with, like in a relationship, that that sort of thing. Right. Um, yeah, you can become blind and and uh, and uh, numb um, without really realizing, uh, you know, what you have. And uh, so it's it's a beautiful song to me for that reason. All right, I want to ask you about the person that's significant on the other end of that song. <laughs> I, but yeah, that's that's great. Okay, uh, you know, before the break, I said, hey, listen. Uh, Tell us some specific instances about uh, some of these things that went on in the in this house or in, in your investigations. So, where do you want to start? You want which which your favorite one? Uh, what was the most compelling? Or do you want to just tell us about the ones I asked you about? Um. Well, no, I don't mind. Uh, you know, one of the ones that I think really uh, got to me because it has uh, photo and video uh, evidence, and and it's just uh, involves a child, which is always. Um, compelling. Uh, this is the story of uh, uh, Ashwar, uh, which I call the invisible but not imaginary friend. And um, yeah. <clears throat> when Donna's uh, daughter uh, or her grandson, Dale, um, so her daughter's son, was still a preschooler, uh, he would say that um, that he had a sister. And, you know, and so they, they would, he would tell people that uh, that and um a sister sometimes he said friend and uh it was something that begun even before he was a year and a half as far as them seeing him uh sit back in his crib uh you know paying attention to something uh smiling and kicking and you know giggling that sort of thing mm-hmm. and um when he was older and started to uh, talk he would uh, be pointing at in the same area uh, towards the ceiling like he's engaged and there's something up there trying to tell people it's there, but um, there's nothing there. And he started um, pronouncing the word badly at first, uh, Ashwar. And um, 
uh, this would uh, continue, and he would, uh, when he, of course, was talking, I think he was about four by the time uh, the story really broke. He told the complete details that Ashwar was a little girl in a blue dress. Uh, she had died in a car accident with her mother, and she was stuck in the large tree outside the front of their house to observe, which is a weird word for a four-year-old to use. <laughs> And uh, Paulino was here in 2005, so this case has been, you know, ongoing uh, for, you know, for quite a while. And uh, Paul talked to uh, Dale, and uh, Dale, uh, he, Paul asked, uh, is Ashwar here now? And Dale said, oh, yeah, she's right outside. And he went to the window and pointed up right up in the tree, and it was pitch dark at that time. Paul went out with his infrared camera, filmed up into the tree, and it ended up getting this uh, tadpole serpent-like thing that came down from the tree. And um, he didn't see it at the time, but later on he found it in the video. And, and the video has been checked by various professionals, including uh, one of our favorite consultant, consultant on the job was Mark D'Antonio, an astrophysicist and a uh, audio-video optical expert for the Mutual UFO Network, um, who, who examined all the photos in my book as well as, uh, well, and some that are not in the book because they were not real unknowns. They were, you know, optical illusions because, um, honest or not, when you use cameras and stuff, you're going to get some things that are just, you know, normal, normal stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, so this was a fascinating fa- find. And then we ended up finding a old, um, uh, an old movie. Uh, of uh, uh, that uh, Donna had uh, just playing with Dale, and so we we saw this on 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 film again. Him pointing and you know trying to say Ashwar um, is a very fascinating, and uh, even more it gets weirder because uh, we ended up uh, finding this uh, gentleman uh, Gregory Harold from Florida who back in the 70s, he ended up seeing the video, and back in the 70s, he was trying to catch a vandal and put out an infrared camera and ended up recording these creatures, a bunch of ashwars. So he had contacted uh, Paulino, and he said, well, I, you know, I know what that thing is. Um, I've been recording them for about two years, and he sent me an hour and a half of video footage of these creatures, and he studied their behavior and, and so on. So I ended up interviewing him for the book. Um, so it's a very, really fascinating example of just the kind of bizarre stuff that happens in that area. Of course, when, when you know, a child says it's a little girl in a blue dress, we know it really never is a little girl in a blue dress, you know. Um, and uh, this was the kind of thing later on. Um, Dale was, uh, he was giving... Uh, more information about it, you know, the, the type of car it was, other kinds of details. It was very interesting. And, uh, and they knew, of course, based on the nature of the house and phenomena, as well as the nature of, of him, uh, you know, that uh, that he wasn't walking around. He, he's a very practical kid, if you ever met him. But um, but certainly by uh, all the, the evidence around it, um, that uh, he was seeing this uh, this entity, and you know the dogs, of course, reacted and stuff. So, but I mean, that's that's an ex- an example, you know. Yeah. So, w- w- in, the, in the pictures in your book, and everybody's going to want to look at this. Just you know, get your books, just see the pictures. But the pictures in your book, of course, show this um, creature. It, it's a head's, you know, it's got a big head, uh, big eyes. Um, Short body, you, know, you say estimated maybe 12 inches long. Uh, it has two appendages like arms but no hands. When, when I'm looking at it, you know, it may even look a bit like a, a sea creature of some kind, okay? Mm-hmm. So you're saying that this this is an ashwar and that somebody in Florida was filming a number of these and so despite the fact that the boy, Dale, I believe his name was, despite the mm-hmm. fact that he was describing a girl in a blue dress, what he was really seeing is some kind of life form of this earth or of, you know, wherever it comes from that you find elsewhere. Have I got that right? 
Uh, yes, uh, but when Dale is seeing it, he is seeing a little girl in a blue dress. I right. mean, I, yeah. I, I believe that's the way, because these things will appear uh, in, in different forms to you, sometimes uh, in a form to get your attention in one way, other times uh, to get your attention in another way. And in this case, if you want to communicate with the child, you have to uh, appear in a somewhat non-threatening manner. And so right. that would that would be why you have the common archetype of little girl in a blue dress or little girl in a yellow dress. Yeah, so. but the mechanic, what's actually behind it, not the projection, what the individual is seeing, the child is seeing, is this uh, this creature-like thing uh, that you've now identified in more than in one location. Have I got that right? Right, right. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, All right. that's, that's what's bizarre about it is finding the connection. And, and I actually got chills when I started watching the other video, realizing that this is the same thing. Yeah. And um, and this guy went through lens, too, to have different optical and, and ph- photographers and uh, videographers, just people, for anyone who can give him any sort of explanation. But he saw the stuff with his own eyes, too, uh, in addition to catching it on film so it really did he was... see him for what they were or did he see him as some projection that they showed themselves to him as no no he saw them in the actual form that uh for what that, they were yeah for what they were yeah uh, so do, yeah. do you think this is uh, this is a phenomena from the spirit world this is a phenomena from what we think of as ufos i mean this is this is actual entity that, uh, you know, maybe it's from another dimension, but not a, a ghostly being. I mean, how, what do you see these things as being? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, for lack of knowing, I, I normally refer to them as entities. Um, you know, the, the Gregory Harrell would say he concludes they're quote-unquote aliens, and one guess is good as the other. Um, and that's something, sometimes we have a hard time, unless it's the classical, you know, alien gray with the almond eyes kind of, right. you know, we have trouble discerning what's what. Because if we see something outside, we tend to think UFO. We see something inside, we tend to think ghost. But there are similarities between them. We don't have anything in the UFO literature that really describes this kind of being. So I would I wouldn't as, assume it was an alien, uh, although aliens could be no different than other kinds of entities. Right. I, I guess right we can <laughs> we can almost put them together, but we tend to think of them as uh, you know certain attributes and uh, etc. But um, so I would just deem these entities, and and like you said, either from another dimension, another you know multiple another universe, another you know whatever whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, and you know other than that, we don't know much much about them. Yeah, but what, whatever you know uh, they are implied in your descriptions, your observation is uh, an ability that they obviously have to somehow enter the mind and create projections that uh, are consistent with what you would be comfortable with, uh, consistent with what you would feel at ease with, as opposed to showing themselves for what they really are. Very, very interesting. I, I, I could hog your time, and I may come back and do that, but I'm first going to get a couple of questions to you out of our chat room from the phones, uh, because that's what this sure. half hour is about. Okay. Uh, Susie wants to know, she says, I'm going to throw this question in right now for possible response from Mr. Hall. It is my understanding that William Hall is also a magician and could, if he wanted to, do a psychic reading. So my question is, with his knowledge to do so, what should one look for when trying to ferret out the good psychics from the bad? Uh, well, it's, um... It's a real problem. I mean, uh, I would say probably 99.9% of psychics that are quote unquote open for business would be cold readers, which would be, uh, poor man's psychiatrists as they call right. them or, um, and, and they're just going to read you 
colds. And um, so if you wanted to go see a psychic, I mean, psychics are, and I'm talking fake, of course, when, you know, when I'm using that term. So right. uh, when you, if you're going to see a psychic, they know you're going to them for a reason. You know, somebody close to you has died and you want to know something uh, or you have some sort of problem in life. And if I see you, and you know, I'll look at your hands, I'll look at your face, I'll, I'll judge what stage of life you're in. I'll be, you know, somebody looks at my hands, they'll know that I, that I don't do hard labor. So that instantly tells you a whole slew of things about me. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's very, you know, how do you tell a good one from a bad? I, I would say don't go because they're, I would say chances are they're, they're all bad. Um, the only psychics that I've ever, or empaths or mediums, in, there's some obviously distinctions, but by and large, to me, they've all had one thing in common. They, they don't really operate that way. You know, they don't tell futures. Yeah. Um, or, or fortunes. But, you know, the, the best way to, um, to, um, ferret out, uh, 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 I managed to get in the chat room. I'm proud of me. Uh, but the best way to um, tell a good psychic from the bad is the way David Letterman is, which is uh, when he had a channeler on there to speak uh, to contact the dead, um, uh, to have them contact or tell you about somebody who doesn't exist. And uh, you'll find they'll go on telling you about it. So if I, you know, when I went to, I want to prove to a friend that, you know, psychic was fake and he believed the person was real. So I went there and, and of course they ask you, you know, would you like to talk about what he wanted? They're always going to fish for information and they're going to want you to give up information. The best way, number one, is don't give them any information at all. Don't tell them why you're there, what you want to know about. Don't tell them anything. You tell me and it better be specific because it's going to be general than, it's going to be like a horoscope. Looks like you know, for fun in college, I used to read people the wrong horoscope, and then they would say, "Oh, that's exactly like me." And I'd say, <laughs> "Well, I, I read, you know, you're a Gemini, and I read a Taurus." So you know what I mean. So right, right. Uh, you know, again, we all read into that. So, but the best way is number one: don't say anything, demand specifics, don't tell them anything, and make up stuff. If I, I went to psychic with, uh, like I said, uh, years ago, a guy who believed in him, and uh, and he says, no, you got to go. I said, okay, I'll go. And I went there, and I said, uh, and you know, the guy said, Mr. Hall, what brings you here today? I said, I want to know about my brother. And he went on for 10 minutes fishing, uh, you know, about my brother. And finally, I said, I don't have a brother. <laughs> so that, you know, now, now what, you know? Right. Uh, and, you know, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's very simple. I mean, psychics, again, it's like cure for cancer. If you want to buy the cure for cancer, somebody will sell it to you. And psychics know, um, that you have a problem. And in, instead of like a psychologist who will say, what brings you here? Uh, which a psychic may say that too. Uh, but a psychic's job is to guess at your problem. And, and the idea behind it is you'll only remember success. And you won't remember the failures. So I can be wrong about 20 things. But if I happen to hit one right, you know, if I get the month of your birthday right, or if, and, and God forbid I happen to, to, um, to hit on something by luck, I could have you be an instant believer instantly. I mean, years ago, I used to carry different things with me and ask people questions. And nine times out of 10, they, give the wrong answer but um if they give the right answer then you say reach into my pocket and you have the exact word written you know name a word you say a word any word and they say blue or whatever yeah. you know and, and you know you make it as a joke if they get it wrong you're not telling them what you're doing but the minute they say the right word and you have it or the right card or whatever it happens to be uh which in the magic business we call that simplicity audacity and bluff uh now you're a miracle worker so, right. so even if they're accurate, it doesn't prove they're real because they're only going to be accurate about certain things. Uh, the best, my best advice would be record the session, send it to me, and free of charge, I'll let you know uh, if they're wrong, uh, you know, if they're fake. And if they are fake, I'll tell you why because we all use the same tools. Uh, well, it's an art form. And if you're a layman, you're not going to understand the art form, just like I'm not a mechanic, so don't ask me to repair your car. So <laughs> you're, bas you're, ba you're basically going to a, uh, a machine gun fight unarmed because 
you know, you want to believe, so they already have uh, the upper hand on you. So there you go, Susie. You've got it. You've got the perfect man here. If you're going to go, record it, send it to William, free of charge. He'll uh, he'll tell you what you've got. But I would add one more element to what you're saying, uh, William. And you you disagree with me if you do. Um, you know, make it said. Um, very often when you see these psychics, they will tell you something that may have to do with the future. You're going to meet someone, you know, da da da. That will predispose you to find it. You know, our world is more our expectation than it is anything else. And if you set that expectation up, well, you're going to have a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's that simple, and you may be very sorry for that down the highway. You agree or yeah, disagree with well. that, William? No, I, I no, I, I completely agree. All right, one more quick one out of the, and we need a quick one because we've only got a couple of minutes, and I want you to have time to, you know, tell everybody about your website, etc. This one's from Mark. Question is: Can you comment on paranormal and UFO activities along the thirty-third parallel? That would be the Bermuda uh, Triangle, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I can't offhand. I mean, other than um, it is, you know, definitely energy related. I, I know people in the military. Uh, a buddy, a very close friend of mine was in the Navy, uh, and he told me, you know, that they all take the Bermuda Triangle very seriously. Uh, they will still go through it. Um, not all the time, but they'll go through it. Um, but definitely they have the whole disturbance with instruments and whatnot. And it's, and it's a, he said it's a well known fact. This was years ago. You know, he had told me that. And so I believe there's something there. Um, and, uh, I don't see why it's far fetched. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of things around it, of course. Uh, All right. you know, and, uh, you know, William, in 30 seconds or so. Tell everybody how they can learn more about you, where they can, you know, get your book and and et cetera and so forth. Oh yeah, well that's uh, I could do it in less. Uh, William J Hall Author dot com. I'd be happy to to sign and mail you a book. Uh, it also has uh, appearances and interviews, some free stuff, uh, or you can message me there. Um, so I answer all my emails. Uh, so when you go to that website, you'll find everything there. And I hope you enjoy it. And I thank everybody for listening. Including his lectures. And once again, the book, The Haunted House Diaries, The True Story of a Quiet Connecticut Town in the Center of Paranormal Mystery. It is a great read. It's a great investigation. Uh, I you. urge you to get a copy of it. And William, I want to thank you for your work and for your willingness to share it with us and to do so as candidly and honestly as you do. Oh, thank All you. right. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank our guest once again and all of you out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show, and we'll join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends. Let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time. Wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.